with our guest, Miami, Florida. Hi, am I on? Yes, go ahead. Hi, Ray. I have to say that I'm a great fan of yours. But that being said, I have a question about one time you talked about you, your utopian future, th that the future would not be utopian despite the fact of a growth of technology. And I'd like you to explain that for me, please. Well, I alluded earlier to technology being a double-edged sword. So take biotechnology. I mean, that's, I think, actually a great revolution that's happening now, that we're going from a pre-information era where we just happen to find something uh, and we don't really know why it works, uh, to where we can actually reprogram biology as an information technology. And that's a, gra that's a grand transformation. But it has positive and negative consequences. The positive is that I believe we will be able to reprogram biology away from cancer and heart disease and, and these other diseases that kill us. 15, 20 years from now, I think we will really overcome these diseases, at least make them manageable, chronic conditions if not eliminate them altogether through the power of biotechnology. But the downside is it also empowers a bioterrorist to, cr to reprogram a biological virus to make it more deadly or stealthy or, or communicable. And that's an existential specter that we face right now, and we really need to be doing more about it. But these technologies can be used for, for creativity or destruction. I think the problems that we've been focused on that humanity has struggled with for eons, we will ultimately, over the next several decades, get the tools to overcome those problems. But we will still be struggling then with new problems that these technologies introduce. Will the companies that develop them themselves be able to give proper oversight? Well, uh, I mean, we have a regulatory system. I think it needs to be reformed in, in many ways, both to protect ourselves more from these types of dangers on the one hand, and on the other hand, accelerate the approval of uh, life-saving uh, protocols and medications that uh, take too long to be developed. And this is actually an issue in defending ourselves against the dangers. Because I mentioned how well we're doing with software viruses, that we can, in one day, capture a virus, a software virus, reverse engineer it, create a, an antidote and spread it virally around the internet. And that system actually works extremely well, not perfect, but uh, one of the reasons we can't do that in, bio in biology is because of this regulatory system we have. You can't create something, let's say an RNA into eye medication, and put it out in a day. I mean, a typical approval time is measured in years, not days. And this is actually a concern with, with bioterrorism. Uh, how, do you, how do you test these things all together when nobody has these diseases? And it would be unethical to actually test them because you can't give people these diseases in order to test them. So we, we need to do some more creative thinking. I've written about how to approach this problem. Uh, but yes, we, I mean, regulation is going to be very important. We're going to have to reform it in light of these new opportunities and dangers. Kingsport, Tennessee, go ahead, please, you're on with Ray Kurzweil. Yes, you are giving a demonstration, Mr. Kurzweil, concerning the handheld scanner to convert print to speech. Does that work on most print fonts? Where can we get more information, and what's its approximate cost? Yes, that, uh, we just introduced the Kurzweil National Federation of the Blind Reader in July. It's on the order of a thousand blind guys and gals going around reading everything from the labels and their clothing to signs on the wall, the back of cereal boxes and menus and handouts at meetings and so on. It probably costs thirty-five hundred dollars. Uh, it it does read. Uh, all common fonts. It, it won't read on, won't work on handwriting yet, uh, but it, it works on all fonts, different sizes. It's really quite flexible. If you, if, if this print in its field of view, it generally does a good job reading it. Um, and you can get information at knfbreader.com. Knfbreader.com. We have about two minutes left, but uh, this final email, should we fear computers and machines as they begin to equal us in intelligence? Well, we do fear other humans, right? Uh, and, you know, we have one human civilization, but it's not been free from conflict. And we had 180 million people die in wars in the 20th century. Maybe as we reverse engineer the human brain, we'll have more insight as to the sources of human conflict but I'm not predicting that that was, is going to lead us to eliminate human conflict. 
And I think it's still going to be one integrated human civilization, even more integrated because of this pervasive uh, internet that we have, and, and, and that's going to grow in power. Uh, but, but we're not going to eliminate human conflict. In fact, we're empowering individuals to be more destructive with the same technology that we're empowering individuals to be creative. So I would fear uh, the aspects of humanity that we don't understand that, that allow us to be destructive and, and uh, deploy technologies in, in ways that are uh, inimical to, I think, our better values. Uh, I'm hopeful we can do a better job in the 21st century than we did in the 20th century. Uh, I th my own feeling is we will, but that's the optimist in me talking. But we fear uh, human hatred, and uh, that unfortunately is also amplified by these technologies. And hopefully we can uh, take that into account. Uh, I've written a lot about how we might do that, uh, but that is, that is something to be feared. Do you have a new book that you're working on? Well, my next book is tentatively titled uh, How the Human Brain Works and How to Build One. But that's a number of years off. I've got a number of other irons in the fire before I get to that. But I am I'm doing now what I do in the early stages, which is gathering information.